fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. The constitutional point of view was critical for Jefferson's support of the Bill of Rights. It's Saturday. Welcome to the Hayden Collins Radio Program, the Intelligence Syndicate. We are working hard. <laughs> okay, a little tickle this past week. Got to do some more observations. The debates are on, which creates a interesting point of view from the press. We had seven of the interns watch the debates and give us comments on these wonderful, well, <laughs> scoped debates, if you will. There were some different spins. You're gonna hear, oh, you know, all of the obvious things are gonna take place. So those of you that are new to the political spectrum understand the following. All the Democrats are gonna say, oh, there were great debates. And they're going to give away everything. And, and Trump is evil. Okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. What do you expect them to say? Uh, the Republicans are going to say, oh my gosh, uh, it's a trip towards socialism. Just pick the candidate you want and you're right down that path. And there's no middle of the road. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the opinions of the interns that actually watch the debates. Now, opinion number one. When compare, oh, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. Four of the interns are, um, did the last presidential campaign and watched the debates then. So you're going to hear some comparison comments. I have to let you know this up front. There will be some comparison comments. Because the reason that brought that to my attention is the first one is a comparison comment. Why? When you have a democratic debate, do you have all of the democratic people that are reporters giving super softball questions? Now, if you don't know what a softball question is and you're new to politics, it's uh, what color is the sky during a blue day? That's a that's a softball softball question. So the democratic debates are loaded with softball questions. And the intern said, you know, well, why is that? Why do the Democratic debates get loaded with soft, softball questions? Now, this particular intern was around for the Hillary questions of the last debate that were given to her in advance, and were around for the Trump questions and the hardball stuff. So there, there, was some, there was some play in the conversation. We actually went back to YouTube and looked at some of the questions then, and we looked at the questions now. And I can't say it was that obvious, but I'd have to agree with that opinion is that there was a lot of softball questions. A lot of them. Uh, there were some gimme questions. Now a gimme question is, we're gonna ask you a question to allow you to talk about what your platform is. So since we like you, we're going to give you a gimme question that's right up your alley for your platform so you can talk about mm, your platform. And there were five of those to obvious candidates. That's what kills me, to obvious candidates. But there were five gimme questions. And the, and the gimme questions were, geez, presidential candidate, tell us all about your life work. Now, the observation uh, from two of the interns is these individuals have been in office for a really long time talking about things that they had an opportunity to do while they're in office and now they want to try to do it as president but they weren't able to do it in the position they're in why should we even trust them for that 
And that was a unique perspective. And I'm going, okay, this came from an independent, by the way. This intern's an independent. Well, by the way, the Democrat on the intern, well, I guess we have two Democrats. Yeah, the two Democrats on the intern list that we currently have, both of them were uh, not as excited as I would thought they, I thought they would be. Um, both interns are university interns, and both interns are pro-Democrat. And a couple of the comments that they made were quite revealing. One of them was, there's nobody on that stage that we would like to represent us in the future. That was one. And that was a wow moment for me. Nobody on the stage that they would want to represent them. So I indulged in that. I'm going, okay, what's, what's going on? Why would you say that? And their comment was, they're giving away everything for free and they're going to destroy the economy when they do it. And I went, wait, what? They're trying to give away everything for free and they're going to destroy the, the economy when they do it. I said, okay, explain yourself. Now, this is what's most revealing. Look at any socialist country. I said, yeah, they've removed the incentive. There is no incentive to be successful. There is no incentive to advance yourself. There is no incentive to go and do things. You're only allowed to achieve what the government allows you to achieve. Now, I... I resummarize that. That was a long conversation. But I resummarize that. And I'm going, okay, that's really good. Tell me why. Now, this is where things went a little south for me. <laughs> it's not, I didn't get what I expected. Uh, all right, let me see this note. Okay, so where it went a little south for me was, well, we still believe you should work for your success. And I said, okay. And they said, well, government doesn't provide you success. Government is not supposed to provide you success. And I said, hmm, this is kind of a different spin from what the candidates are saying on stage. And then they took me right back around to the circle and they said, yeah, that's why these candidates really don't represent us. And I went, oh boy. Imagine you're the DNC chair and you have all these candidates up there and you have college kids in middle America, well actually one of them's in California, that are sitting there saying, no, that's not what we want and that's not what we're interested in. And I tell you, here's the backslide on that. They've had a taste of what a good economy should be like. They, and they'll get to experience this. I've had talk with this with my students. I've had talk with this with coworkers and so on and so forth. The young individuals that are coming out of college this day, this, this year, in the next couple of years, are going to get to experience the best economy that this country has ever had. It'll be way better than any economy that I came up in. It'll be way better than any economy before that. And it's going to be huge. And it's gonna be extremely successful. And when something starts like that, the unique thing that takes place after that creates a snowball effect. And once it starts creating that snowball effect, it builds and builds. Here's an observation. A lot of goods and services that were built in the United States a long time ago, all of a sudden started being built in China because the cost of labor was cheaper and there were no more import fees so American companies were closing up and or send their businesses overseas because they could no longer compete inside the United States. So a lot of our jobs went overseas. A lot of things went overseas. And money went overseas. Makes sense. Well, now that jobs are coming back to the United States because the environment inside the United States is pro-worker, that's supposed to be a Democrat thing, during a Republican presidency. You gotta think about that one hard. Uh, pro worker, pro jobs, you know, pro family, um, jobs are coming back. Businesses are investing in the United States to produce here. Now, these are large businesses, these are huge businesses, but this is the unique thing about this Walmart's in trouble. 
Oh, geez, Hayden, why is Walmart in trouble? Well, their biggest supplier is China. They got to start finding some U.S. suppliers real quick because the deals aren't going well. <laughs> the All-American Store, <laughs> Walmart. But, but I want you to take that to scale. I want you to take it completely to scale. All of the large companies out there that used to buy from Chinese vendors or overseas vendors, I won't just use China because China's not the only one, but overseas vendors are going to find themselves in a position where the attractiveness of a U.S. entrepreneurship-based economy that is coming out of nowhere will be able to provide them what they need inside the United States and create jobs here. It's almost the backlash of the Buy America program the unions had in the 70s and 80s. You know, if you're not buying American, you're not helping us. Well, they were absolutely right. They're absolutely true. The unions were correct. And, and look what happened. Now it's, okay, the backlash is, well, you know what? If you don't buy American, you starve. Or you have to depend on the government. Nobody likes depending on the government. And then all of a sudden things change. So it's an attitude that is changing. So that was the perspective there. That, that's how, what I got out of that conversation. It was absolute attitude change. So there is nothing on that stage that represents the new attitude. There is nothing on that stage that represents a future attitude that's acceptable to the students that are on the internship program. Now, I hope that made sense. I know it was a long explanation. Okay, warbirds. We have to talk about warbirds. All right, none of the questions, and I do mean none of the questions, really drove home anything to do with foreign relations and current, current footing of U.S. interest overseas and current conflicts overseas. They were completely avoided. Now, warbird, so you know, is a political term for a politician who's really pro-military, really pro-United States to the point to where, you know, they're really, go conquer the communist. We got to remove them from the planet kind of guy or gal. So there, there's no warbirds on the stage. There's no America first on the stage. And people of the United States have had a good three years and they're going to probably have a good four years and maybe eight years of, hey, America is the only free nation in the world that leads all of these lower governments. And these lower governments depend on the United States. That's why their people keep coming here. They're not running there. So consider that for a moment. No warbirds. Now, Another observation. You had three-piece sets up on stage. Now, this, this is a phrase I hope it catches. If it does, I get to take full credit for it. But you had three-piece sets up on stage. Well, geez, what's a three-piece set? You know how you get a you know, a dining room set or you know, a chair and, or a couch and two chairs or whatever. It comes as a set. An ottoman, three-piece ottoman or a three-piece couch, whatever. There were three-piece sets up on stage. Now, we're not going to drive the candidates home, and it's not the way they were positioned on stage or anything like that, but you could take the transcript of three of the candidates and not put their names to it, and you wouldn't know who was saying it. You could take three other candidates and do the same thing, and you wouldn't know who was saying it. In fact, if you were to take their quotes from the debates and put them out there with their names not attached to it and ask people to connect the quote to the candidate, they're going to have a real tough time doing it. Now, normally people would have a real tough time doing that anyway, even with Republican candidates. But this was so one-track driven. This was so one-sided that you had three-piece sets in each one of the debates. And those three-piece sets, they don't stand out. There is nothing different from any of those three-piece sets that we currently have in the Senate or than we currently have in the House. No difference. And there's no accomplishments to go along with those three-piece sets. None whatsoever. They just sit around. That's why we call them three-piece sets. Thought you'd get a kick out of that. I wish I could take credit for that. That came from one of the kids, too. 
All right, and then now we, <laughs> one of the final observations here from the debates. We have what you call the courtyards. Now, some of the minor candidates, one of them I really like, by the way, I'm not going to say his name, but I don't know if the guy has a chance or not. You know, the dogs are not out of the race yet, but I like this guy. And uh, <laughs> I went and read the transcript and read what he said, and I'm going, okay, he doesn't fit in one of the three piece sets. Um, boy, that's interesting. So he, he really didn't fit in there. So I, we started looking around. We found five of the candidates that not, not fit in the three piece sets. So we call them the courtyard. Now, in the courtyard, and this goes way back to the days of old, kings were taught how to play chess for a reason because they were supposed to think three moves down the road four moves down the road. They had to see the end of the battle before the battle. They had to see the concept before they started something. That was the purpose of chess. And it's still used for that. It's a very good tool. But in the game of chess, there are pawns. And these pawns are used to make kingmakers. You know, you're a kingmaker, you're a pawn. If you make it all the way across, you're a kingmaker. You know, you become queen and yada, yada, yada. So these pawns work really hard to get all the way across the board, but they're slaughtered 99% of the time. They're just completely wiped out. And they're wiped out in the courtyard of the chessboard. There's about five candidates up there that are going to be used and wiped out as pawns to make statements for the Democratic Party that's going to be consumed by other candidates as they're eliminated. And that they're going to be the pawns in the courtyard. And, and I hope that one of the guys I'm looking at and we'll talk, I guess we'll talk about that next week. We're going to reveal some options next week of who's going to be the most successful and who's not. The, the courtyard candidates are going to be the first one to fall. And I dare say that five of the first courtyard candidates will not make the first cutoff date. In fact, I don't even think they'll make... Jeez, I don't even think they'll make the first, uh, first voting round. A lot of them will drop out before the first vote. Well, I take that back. They can't. In order to get their matching federal funding, they have to go to at least a percentage. So they're going to stay in until they get their percentage so they can get their matching federal funding or how, however that works. I was never eligible for that. <laughs> Our races aren't that big. So you got your three piece sets, you got your courtyards, you know, you got your transcripts, your people you can read. You don't know who's saying what, who's quoting what. Uh, I guess it's going to be that way. Now, uh, besides the debates, I talked about this last week. I got a couple of emails on it. I'm going to spend a moment or two on it. Uh, we talked about Mexico finding an army all of a sudden to enforce their immigration laws. Okay, something was brought to my attention via this email that I need to relay to you guys. Do you know that the Mexican immigration laws are probably, well, I don't want to say the toughest, but they're way tougher than what we have. Do you know that you have to have an ID to vote? Do you know you have to have verification to vote? And apparently without special permission, you can't even have a job in Mexico unless you're a Mexican citizen. Which really paints a different picture from what they're telling you on the press. So that document was forwarded to me and we looked through it and said, okay, what does this mean? Okay, what this means is, do you guys remember when they had all the refugees dying in the Mediterranean and coming to Europe and they're supposed to go to their first country and claim asylum in their first country, but they didn't because they had open borders, they ran all over Europe, and now they're being kicked out of some countries because they're tired of the rapes and tired of crap and whatever, yakety schmackety blah, blah, blah. Mexico was doing the same thing. You're supposed to claim asylum in the first country you come to. That's the law. That's the rule. In fact, that country even, you know, says, why are you coming through our country? What are you doing here? But if you don't man your post, if you don't man your borders to defend your own immigration laws, that never happens. So all of a sudden, and I said it last week, Mexico found an army. And when Mexico found an army, they started enforcing their own immigration laws. Keep an eye on that. I have my suspicions on how long that's going to last. But you're going to see something in this election talking about outside influences. All of these countries that have been influenced by Trump to do things that they didn't want to do, 
may try to influence election just to get rid of Trump because they don't want to do it anymore. Just an observation. All right, we come back from the break. We got the twins doing Oops, I Arted again. This is part two from last week. And then something for you to think about during all of these debates and political brouhaha that's going on. Uh, here's the experiment. Shut off your cell phone for the 4th of July, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I mean, you still talk to your family and stuff like that, but no news connections, no Facebook, no Twitter, no nothing. There's the experiment and see how relaxed you are when you come back. Be about it.